Good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm really thrilled to see you all here. Uh, thank you for coming uh, at the first lecture of the spring term of our research ethics lecture series in, with the Rock Ethics Institute. I do want to thank Jonathan uh, and all our staff, Rob Peeler, uh, Deborah Trilnas, and Caroline Umbright for their help in organizing this lecture series. Uh, they put a lot of effort in it, and we're really grateful for their work. Needless to say, none of this could have happened without the constant support of Doug and Julie Rock, and we are thanking them for their ongoing support for the Rock Ethics Institute. And now it's really the time to introduce our speaker, and I'm absolutely thrilled because I think we are very much in the presence of greatness. Um, Dr. Cass is coming to us from the John Hopkins University, where she's the Phoebe Berman Professor of Bioethics and Public Health, both in the Department of Health Policy and Management and in the Berman Institute of Bioethics. Her publications are primarily in the field of US and international research ethics, really the topic that she will be talking about tonight. And she did a lot of work on HIV ethics policy, public health ethics, and ethics of public health preparedness. She is the co-editor of HIV, AIDS, and Childbearing Public Policy, Private Lives with Oxford University Press in 1996. She has also done a lot of work and be, has been part of many um, committees, uh, including the National Cancer Institute Committee to develop recommendations for informed consent documents for cancer clinical trials. She served at the NCI's Central IRB. She has served as a consultant to the President's Advisory Committee on Human Radiation Experiments and to the National Bioethics uh, Advisory Commis Commission. I'm really grateful uh, to welcome you tonight, Dr. Cass. Uh, please join me in welcoming her, too. Thank you, Nikolai, for the very nice introduction, and thank you to you and Jonathan and others for hosting me all day and um, being such lovely um, hosts. I feel like every need has been attended to, and it's a very welcoming community here. Um, so I was asked to uh, speak with you tonight about international research ethics. And there are a lot of ways one might organize a talk like that. I've tried to do a little bit of a lot of things. Um, I'm going to uh, start by talking in a very brief way about what some of the guidelines are for international research ethics. And um, I'll maybe go with the assumption, although I could mention it briefly, uh, how these are a little different from guidelines we have in the United States related to research ethics. So I want to highlight that there are some guidelines specific to the global context. Um, I'm, I have just a couple slides on what are some of the key ethics challenges in international research ethics. Uh, but those themes of the particular challenges are going to recur when I show you data from two studies um, that I had involvement with. Um, one was qualitative, one was a survey um, related to what is sort of going on in the space of global health research and what are some of the ethics questions. Um, and then I end with a description of a training program that we have at Johns Hopkins um, that is at least trying to think about um, collaborating and developing capacity in this space with some uh, scholars and uh, young professionals from Africa. Okay. So um, I imagine that people in the room, but tell me if this is not true, know something about a little bit maybe about research ethics in the United States. Yes, maybe. Um, so in the United States, we have a set of rules and laws that we've had since the 1970s. Um, that uh, both tell us sort of on the rules side things we have to do before we go out and do research with human, be human beings, like we have to send our research to a special committee called an IRB, um, and also that outline uh, to us through this document called the Belmont Report what the Ethics Foundation is for having these rules. 
So um, globally, there are a bunch of other documents. A few of these are sort of older and, and his, to the extent to which the Belmont Report and our 40-year-old regulations can be called historic, um, are also a couple decades old. And then there are a few that are um, very, very recent. So the Declaration of Helsinki might be the one on this list that's most familiar to people. Um, because often when we talk about research ethics in the United States, we not only talk about our own rules, but also the Declaration of Helsinki. Um, for those of you not familiar with it, the Declaration of Helsinki was first drafted in 1964. It's been revised several times since then. And it was the first guideline, some people refer to it as one of the early international guidelines. It was the first guideline that was developed by physicians for physicians. It now has a much broader reach than that. Um, but it was the first guideline that was uh, written by physicians, an international group of physicians, who were trying to um, set rules for themselves because they were often at that time experimenting on their own patients. And there was a risk that they would get so excited about a new idea that they might want to try with a patient that they might forget that their primary responsibility is to the well-being of that patient. So the Declaration of Helsinki has a lot of language that reminds doctors that science is really important and should be done well, but they also shouldn't shortchange any of the interests of their patients. So um, we had the Declaration of Helsinki in 1964, um, but then about three decades later, a group of people got together in Geneva. Geneva is where the World Health Organization is. It's where a lot of, it's where all the United Nations nation, uh, organizations have their um, home base. Um, and there's this organization called CEOMS. The specifics are really not that important. It's the Council for the International Organization of Medical Sciences. They are not part of w the World Health Organization, but they're loosely, they have a close relationship with the WHO. And they started to recognize that um, when research is done in low and middle income countries, in resource poor settings, there are certain kinds of ethics issues that come up that were never addressed in the Declaration of Helsinki. They're not just the kind of interaction, they're not just the ethics questions that come up when I as a researcher interact with you as a participant and what goes on there. There are extra issues that emerge specifically because one is doing research in an environment where the resources are very low, are very small, are very poor. And so the CEOMS guidelines um, dis are, are an attempt to put ethics guidelines out for research conducted in a low or middle income uh, setting, what the, the lingo changes about every 10 years, what used to be called a developing country setting. Um, and what the CEOMS guidelines do, which is interesting, is they take, I don't know, maybe 70 or 80 percent of the Declaration of Helsinki verbatim on purpose and say, um, much of this still applies, and this is part of the CEOMS guidelines. But then they add new language on things like incentives and um, what needs to be done uh, when research is over um, that, are, that were absent in Helsinki and, again, are really relevant to the kinds of challenges that we face as researchers when we go to these other kinds of settings. There now is guidance from uh, many countries. Um, so again, in the same way that we in the United States have our own rules and regulations, um, 40 years ago that was not true around the world. But now there are many such, um, many countries have their own guidelines. And just sort of as an FYI, I put up here for anybody who's interested in this topic um, that the Office for Human Research Protections, which is the um, federal office as part of our U.S. government structure that oversees the regulations we have and oversees the IRBs who must comply with those regulations in Washington. They have a very active um, international uh, division within this thing called OHRP, and they update all the time what the laws are from around the world on research ethics. It's a really nice resource, and I put that here in case anybody ever wants to go look at it. There we go. Um, so uh, in addition to OHRP having this list of the laws from around the world, another thing on the OHRP website, which again, this is only for, this is probably particularly relevant for any of you who think you might go out and do research in another setting. One of the things that the US laws require is that if um, you are part of a university, for example, like Penn State or like Johns Hopkins that gets any kind of federal funds, you're required 
to follow the U.S. rules when you do research with people. And similarly, if you have a project that's funded through the U.S. government like the NIH, you're required to follow the U.S. rules. So even if I go and do my study in Uganda or in Costa Rica, I have to follow the U.S. rules if I'm working for um, an institution like that. So. Um, that means that I, that I not only have to get my project reviewed by an IRB here in the United States at my home institution, but also by an ethics committee, an IRB in the home, uh, in, in the host environment, like again, Uganda or Costa Rica or whatever. Um, those IRBs have to be properly constituted and in keeping with our rules. And so OHRP also keeps a list of the IRBs around the world that have been certified, essentially, in the United States as complying with all of our rules. They have to fill out tons of paperwork. They have to get a special kind of legal document called a federal wide assurance. But again, if you're going to work in another country for the first time and you want to know which IRBs qualify to do the local review, you can go to OHRP site and do that. OK, enough of that kind of technical stuff. Um, there's another document that is very recent that I think is a very practically relevant document. So CEOMS and Helsinki are more trying to be both practically relevant and outline some ethics thinking. The next one, the WHO one, is really intended to be particularly practical, although it does have some ethics uh, thinking in it as well. The WHO guidelines for IRBs uh, only came out a couple years ago, and they essentially are outlining if you are an IRB, for example, in uh, Zambia, and you're new, and you want to get yourself up to speed, and you want to feel like you're high quality, or you're a collaborator, and you want to make sure the IRB that you might be working with is of high quality, what does that even mean? How can that be defined? And one of the things that the World Health Organization does as a piece of its core mission is to create international guidelines. They create guidelines on what's appropriate tuberculosis treatment. They create guidelines on what's appropriate HIV screening. They, they get people together from countries all around the world um, by requirement and set up guidelines for what they think counts as essentially minimum standards in many, many, many different domains. So this was the first time that they essentially created a document on minimum standards for these ethics review committees whose task is to review human research. Um, I also just put up a couple other documents that I think are particularly good and particularly interesting. So again, for people interested in international research ethics, um, a lot of the ethics challenges that we've seen in the last 10 years have come through um, the HIV context. And so there are some really great and thoughtful documents that have been put forward by, both by UNAIDS and by the American NIH HIV Prevention Trials Network that provide ethics guidance for HIV prevention trials. But I want to emphasize that their relevance and their um, thinking and justifications go well beyond the HIV prevention context. And again, for people interested in international research ethics, I highly recommend them. The last one I think is interesting because um, it's a, it's guideline, it is a guideline for good participatory practice. And one thing that is um, much more part of the um, buzz, the narrative, I think, in research ethics in the last five years is something called community engagement. It's something that we didn't talk about very much 20 years ago in research ethics, but there's much more emphasis on involving the target communities where we might do our research in planning the research, in thinking about the research, in advising on the research. And this is a guidance document that talks about what it means to engage other people who are more the target audience. Um, OK, so let me move on a little bit to what some of the challenges are in um, international research ethics. And I've grouped them into two categories. I want to be clear that there are many, many, many challenges that you could think of that I, where I would agree, oh my gosh, they should have gone on the list. I don't mean this in any way to be exhaustive, but I wanted to highlight some areas where I think there's been a lot of recognition that there are challenges that have not been resolved and where there's now a pretty significant ethics literature um, again, around both of these topics. So I have one slide about um, challenges related to informed consent, and then another slide or two related to ethics challenges um, related to justice and, and human research. So um, you'll see when I get to the data that one chat, so sorry, let me, let me interrupt and say there are a lot of challenges with informed consent in the United States, too. I want to make sure that that's the background context when we go out and do research with people who have just 
agreed to be part of a research study in the United States. We interview them, whether it's qualitative or through a survey. We try to figure out what they understand about the study into which uh, they, for which they just provided informed consent. It is um, often very demoralizing how little they sometimes understand. And it's not necessary, it's not a sign that they're dumb. There's something that happens in the way we explain research that is sometimes successful and sometimes not so successful. So I want to be clear that this is against a backdrop where even in the United States where people generally are speaking the same language and are sort of coming up through a similar kind of cultural ethos, reading some of the same newspapers, there are challenges. So then you go to an environment where, for example, there is no vocabulary word in the local language for research for placebo, for randomization, and I think even more fundamentally as a challenge, people aren't talking about research. Research is not part of the daily life. In, in your lives, and again, I don't know what all of your backgrounds are, I imagine that you hear about some kind of research study every week or two, whether or not you're really aware of it. There's something that comes out that says coffee's good for you. There's something that comes out that says coffee's bad for you. There's something that comes out that uh, says this is the effect of you know running three times a week. There's something that comes out that says something else. And without our even realizing it, we're hearing a lot about research. And so when someone comes in in the American setting and does an informed consent discussion with you, they don't go into a long thing about this is what research is and why we do it and do you understand what research is. They just jump right in and start talking about this particular asthma trial or health education study. They assume you know what research is and they just get to the specifics of the study. To some degree, we have transported that model to other parts of the globe and I think often don't recognize that there's this whole background conversation that hasn't happened that you might argue is pretty essential or fundamental to then understanding what the specific study is about. And I think, when, again, when we get to some of the data about what people's understanding is of the encounter they just went through, I think sometimes it may reflect the fact um, that we treat informed consent as a specific conversation about a larger enterprise they must understand when maybe that's not always true. Um, okay, there are challenges about who should be involved. So again, the model that we have in the United States generally is that one person from the research team talks to the individual participant who's being invited to take part in the study. Sometimes there's another family member there, certainly if it's a child in the study, sometimes even if it's not a child in the study, but it's not usually our model to involve more people. In other parts of the world where sometimes more people are involved in big decisions anyway, and again, where maybe the way learning ordinarily happens might be different than that kind of model. Um, it's hard to know who to involve, what's going to be the best for the ethics reasons we're doing this, which is to make sure people really understand what's going on, and then what's going to be required for the more legal pieces of it that are still required if you're following American rules, which is getting some kind of documentation that this conversation um, happened. Uh, again, what type of discussion works best? Now, I am increasingly a believer that some of the models that have been developed in other countries um, should be transported back here. I've seen some unbelievably creative things. It's certainly much more common to have um, group conversations that are then followed by individual conversations. So there might be a nurse who stands up in front of a room of women filled like this and talks about a trial that's going on for pregnant women. And um, people start asking questions, and you hear each other's questions. And I think it's a really different way to um, get a conversation going in a non-intimidating fashion. I've also seen a lot of examples of people using um, news media, particularly if a study is going out to a community, radio spots, newspaper spots. There's one study I worked with for a few years that was a tuberculosis um, prevention study in South Africa and Zambia, where they got people together through other means like soccer matches, and then did uh, dramatizations of what the research was about. They had actors talking about what it was like to have tuberculosis and what would happen and whether you're contagious and what you have to do, and then somebody acting out what it means to get treatment and then what the study would be, and again, um, it's a much more creative approach to learning than we tend to do um, here. Okay, so challenges related to justice. And again, I could have put other things on uh, this list. But here are some of the things that I call justice-related challenges. What are researchers' duties during studies? 
And by calling this a justice challenge, what I mean is, what is fair to the participants? What do they fairly deserve? What is the fair way to think about what should be provided to participants in a research study? And maybe you can think of a HIV prevention study or a malaria vaccine study. Some of the kinds of big public health research studies being done, a vitamin A supplementation study. Um, what should be provided to the people who join, what should be provided to people in a control group if there's both an intervention arm and a comparison control arm. Um, there's this phrase ancillary care. That means um, what, if anything, ethically do we have a responsibility to provide to our participants when they have health needs that are beyond those related to the study itself? So maybe I'm doing a malaria vaccine study, but somebody comes in with a hurt foot, or I have children enrolled in my malaria study and the mother comes in and she has a problem, a health problem, and I may be the only health person for 100 miles. And what are my ethical responsibilities? It doesn't quite feel right to say, no, sorry, my job is as a researcher. But on the other hand, I have a budget for my research and not to provide care. And I'm probably also aware that once word gets out that there's a doctor or nurse in this particular place who will treat people for anything, there, you know, there, there not only goes the budget, but there goes the time. It, they're, they're genuine um, ethics challenges, and it's hard to know. What are researchers' duties after studies? And I'm going to have a lot more data on this, but um, I do my study. I learn that this way to do HIV prevention or TB prevention actually is effective. Now, by the way, not all research studies are conclusive, and they're not all positive, but sometimes they are. And what are we supposed to do afterwards? Do I owe something to this community um, who joined the study? Do I owe something more if the study wasn't beneficial? It's hard to figure those kinds of things out, but they're really important questions. And particularly when you go into an environment where people don't have much, it becomes pretty important to think about these things. And I think most researchers in the field, if they have any kind of introspection and compassion, are confronted with these and have to figure out what to do. Um, OK, let me keep going. What type of incentive or um, free care, if any, is appropriate? There are huge debates on, on whether to provide something to the participants in studies. It's um, not atypical in research studies in the United States to provide people with a little bit of money or their uh, transportation costs or a little bit of food or something when they come to a research study. And um, some people certainly do that in international studies. And a lot of people think that's a really good idea because it's respectful and people take off time to come. And other people say, no, 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 that will become an undue incentive. They're going to be so excited to have the money or the food or the free care that they're not even going to pay attention to the informed consent information. Now, some of these claims are empirical claims. And as someone who does empirical research alongside um, some policy-oriented ethics, I'm a big believer in trying to get as much data as we can um, if it will help inform our, our policy recommendations, right? If we're saying, well, we shouldn't provide an incentive because it will lead people to tune out informed consent information, that's a hypothesis. That's a testable question. Um, there are other kinds of ethics claims that are not based on empirical data, and they really just represent a, a difference of, of values. Um, and then uh, what's the relationship between the study and the host institutions? And this is also a real life big, big, big challenge that I um, another one where I totally understand, I guess what I'll call both sides of this debate. So what I mean by this is, let's say that I have funding to do a big project related to HIV prevention, malaria prevention, whatever, um, in a resource poor country. And that resource poor country does not have tons of great uh, infrastructure that I need for my study. I need high quality laboratories to test all the blood samples. Um, I need high quality databases. I need high quality grants management or I'm going to get in trouble with my funder. Um, I need high quality staff, nurses and doctors. And at a certain point of working through the regular system in that country where I keep being frustrated that uh, I don't know, there's corruption, the work ethic isn't the same. I'm sort of repeating things that I've heard. There aren't enough trained people. You train somebody and then they quit. 
um, there are more and more and more studies that set up what I call a parallel play universe, where they build their own clinic, they train their own people, they hire their own people, they set their own H human resources rules about when people have to show up on time and, and when their work day is done, and essentially they can control um, what the work environment is. And on the one hand, these uh, extra um, uh, strategies can be really successful for getting the work done. They still generally are hiring local people. Those local people stay when the study is over. They have a lot of uh, training. Um, and it often does yield more efficient um, research uh, uh, study completion. At the same time, as we can well understand, often some of the uh, brightest people sort of get siphoned off to be part of that. And to the extent to which this study is an opportunity for resources to come in from another country, like the United States and NIH, to invest in the local health infrastructure or invest in a local university so that they can train other people and have more resources that are really usable to them when the study is over, um, it doesn't do that. And so there are big debates and again some, um, some scholarship uh, on this. Okay, and then I have a slide on what's the role of the IRB in all these justice questions. So one thing that's sort of um, funny from a policy perspective is that the only formal structure we have for thinking about ethics and research is the IRB, the Institutional Review Board. And they're really important and they tend to be very thoughtful and they do their best. The IRB in a lot of ways has a fairly narrow purview. So definitely what is the responsibility of the IRB is to protect the welfare of the participants who will be in the study. So if my study is enrolling 500 people, their real responsibility is to protect those 500 people make sure they're not exposed to undue risks, that they're told about the study um, as they should be, et cetera. But the problem is when we start to think about international research ethics or other kinds of research ethics, we identify all sorts of other ethics issues that make us a little anxious. Like what should we do about ancillary care? And should they build a separate clinic or should they work on improving the clinics that were part of the national health system? And then, and what should happen after the study is over, right? None of those actually, I mean, maybe the ancillary care, but the other two certainly don't relate to the welfare of those 500 participants. They relate to these much bigger and broader justice questions. And so when people like me write articles, or lots of other people write articles and say, this is right in international research ethics, this is wrong, people should make sure that X happens, people should make sure Y doesn't happen. The only group with any authority, with any gatekeeping responsibility, is the IRB. Arguably, funders have some. Funders could say, you need to set up your clinic this way or not that way. You need to do this afterwards. But for the most part, it's the IRB. But it gets really complicated because there gets to be um, some amount of mission creep. And I don't mean that that's necessarily it's, it's not necessarily wrong for the IRB to take a broad view of their responsibility, but it may be unfair of us to put every kind of ethics question that emerges in research on the job of this committee that does have a slightly narrower uh, responsibility. So again, there are certain things that are up to the IRB, like why are we going to Uganda? Could I do the same study in Baltimore? If I could do it in Baltimore, it's hard to justify going somewhere um, else. And again, what are, you gonna, what are you, researcher, going to do? You have to anticipate it when somebody comes into your study site and asks for care for somebody else in the family. You have to be prepared for that. Okay, that's their job. Um, a little bit murky about things like dissemination. They can decide, as a matter of justice, that the researchers have to disseminate the results in a certain way. Um, and some IRBs do, and that's great. Um, but it is already starting to expand the purview a little bit. Um, and again, it certainly is not what I would call the current uh, standard, um, the current norm for IRBs to uh, think about things like the global research agenda. Are we spending too much money on HIV? Should we be, be spending more money on something else? Um, again, whether future access is required as a condition for approval, things like that. Um, okay, let me, let me move to a couple studies that I've done. Um, they're both now getting to be a little bit old. They're both um, from several years ago. But I think that 
uh, some of the findings are, are still relevant, and so I, I picked some of those data to put together here. So the first is a, a small qualitative study that I did with my colleagues Joan Atkinson and Suzanne Maman. And we um, were interested uh, in some of these questions about what is it that people are understanding about the research in which they're enrolled in other countries. So we did semi-structured open-ended qualitative interviews with um, participants um, from, uh, I guess it says on the next slide, six different trials from three countries. Two um, were in Africa, one was in Latin America. Um, these, one big limitation, for any of you who collect your own data, was that um, we used an interpreter. Um, in, um, in the Latin American country, one of our, um, uh, Suzanne and Joan and I did all of the interviews, and um, one of our team was able to speak the language of the participants in Latin America, but that was not true in Africa. Um, and so in Africa, we used an interpreter. Um, I, for example, would ask a question, an interpreter would ask the question in the local language, the respondent would answer and go back. The reason why I emphasize this is that I have quotes up here. And the quotes are from the translator. The quotes are what the translator said. And these were not professional, highly trained translators. So all I can say is we cross our fingers that the question got communicated right and the answer got communicated right. It's the best we have. There's a piece of this that does mimic the real world. Sometimes that's what happens in informed consent, um, but I want to stress it methodologically. So we ended up interviewing 26 um, participants from six different studies. They were all trials. They all had um, two arms to them. Two were prevention trials of TB in HIV-infected patients. Um, one was a microbicide trial to prevent HIV. So you may know there have been a lot of microbicide trials done. Uh, microbicide is uh, like it's a vaginal gel. Um, and there have been several uh, versions of this that have been tested to see if it could prevent um, transmission of HIV. Two studies of prevention of maternal to child uh, transmission of HIV from pregnant women with HIV to children. One was a malaria treatment study uh, for children. Three of the trials used a placebo control, three used an active control, and three were associated with Johns Hopkins, which of course is where I work, and three were not. So we started, as is typical with qualitative research, to try to get a sense of the people and their lives and ask them a little bit about their day and how they earn a living and who they are. And I'm not showing you any of that data. But then we said, what is research? Tell me what research is. And then tell me about the research project you are in. Um, why did you join it? And could you quit the project if you wanted to? And again, I'm just showing some selected data here. So when we asked, um, what is research? Um, we heard things like, it's an activity about medications. One person says, she says the research is like trying to find out about certain drugs, different drugs, if the drugs can help us with several diseases in which they attack a patient. So those you'd say, OK, on the right track. One person said, research project, they build houses. And I put this up here not because I really think that the person answering it thought that they were enrolled in something for many, many months that was going to build houses. But whatever language was used in our question that the interpreter repeated led this person to give us the answer, they're building houses. And the same kind of translation happens when we do informed consent for research. And it just struck me as, boy, how confusing this whole enterprise must be if somehow this kind of vocabulary is getting into the conversation. She thinks the research is where we study knowing about HIV. So a lot of these are, are in a general sense, very on target. Research, I think, is where they try to find out. They search this thing we have because they give us something to drink so our babies can't be affected. This is presumably a maternal to infant transmission study. My baby, he came out normally. He didn't have any sickness. They're trying to find out something about a drug. It's trying to find out about the drug and if it can prevent STDs. It's a project for health. They look after your health. So more and less specific answers. So this was around, can you tell me about the project you're in? This project was about the product, the gel you put in your vagina, if it can help prevent STDs. Do they know if it can? She says yes, because she used it and she was sure it was a good product. How does she know it was a good product? Because when she used the product, there was no problem with the product. And when it was given to the partner, there was no problem. And I know from, this, um, from talking to the investigators of this microbicide study that the women 
liked using it. They found it easy to use. They liked being able to use it without necessarily talking to their partner about it, although some did. And many wanted the microbicide afterwards. Obviously, they had no idea whether they were getting the real microbicide or the placebo. And this turned out to be one of the studies that showed that the microbicide made no difference whatsoever. So again, it's when we think about putting this in the informed consent context, it, um, it uh, is humbling. Why do people join? She signed the form because she wanted the kid to get treatment, to get help. They work with you. Whatever illness you have, they help you. If you have TB, it's good. If you have other illnesses, it's good. They gave you a whole bunch of medicine. You didn't have to pay for any of it. If I hadn't been in the project, I would have died already. So um, I'm going to move on now to showing data from another study we did um, a couple years later. And um, then we can bring it all together a little bit later. So um, the National Bioethics Advisory Commission um, was uh, uh, put together, as a, one in a series of several bioethics commissions we've had since the 1970s. Um, and they were going to study various questions in um, research ethics and international research ethics. They were going to have a special report on international research ethics and um, decided to, uh, and somebody was talking about Eric Meslin earlier. Eric Meslin was the staff director um, of NBAC and of this report. Um, and they wanted some empirical data to inform their report, because their report was going to give ethics guidance to researchers about working when American researchers, this is again an American ethics committee, when American researchers are going to go work in the international setting, what should we as the American government say to them and, and tell them? And so, um, uh, so I was hired, as were other people, to do a couple big studies. And this is uh, data from a study we did with US investigators who go to uh, mostly low-income countries to do their research projects. There was a parallel study that my colleague Adnan Haider did that was um, targeting uh, investigators who were themselves from, who were international investigators who were collaborating. So we ended up um, uh, getting survey responses from 328 investigators who came from academia, private industry, uh, nonprofit, or the military uh, context. Um, and we generally sent these people surveys. Um, but uh, at the end of the survey, there were two open-ended questions that basically said, do you want to tell us anything more? And we also did seven focus groups. So I have some quantitative data and some qualitative data. The qualitative either come from those questions at the end or from the focus groups. So I want to go through some of this quickly, but we asked them, why do you go to another country to do your research? And the top reason was the prevalence of the disease is greater there. Obviously, this makes sense for something like malaria or tuberculosis. 73% um, said, I'm interested in addressing global inequality. Um, there were questions, lots of questions about these justice things. Here's a set of questions about informed consent. We asked people what kinds of consent they used in their research, and we gave them a long list. Written, oral, drama, movies, videos, all sorts of things. Um, and we also asked it separate, at a separate part of the um, survey, we wanted them to think about what we called an index study, the study they'd spent the most time in the last five years. And for that index study, we asked a lot of questions about who's the population, what kinds of topics. So this is sort of putting two data points together, where um, researchers told us that the study they were working with um, included people where 80% or more of the population was illiterate, 60% of them were still using written informed consent. Now, part of that is because there are certain rules that require that, but it's still, you know, you look at that from an ethics perspective or just like a common sense perspective and say, something about this seems a little kooky. Um, but that was a finding. Culturally, it's very difficult for them to understand how your doctor, who's supposed to want good for you, could propose you take nothing. So this is in the idea of how do you explain research and the whole enterprise. It defeats the principles of medicine to some extent. And you know you go a long way to explain that. And then the informed consent becomes very artificial when the very basis of the study design is not understood and the purpose is not understood. And again, we find some of that even in the United States, right? You're so used to going to a doctor who's there to help you. And then you come in with research and basically say, we don't know. We don't know how to treat this. We don't know if one thing's better than the other. So we're going to sort of flip a coin. And some of you get a medicine, and some of you get nothing. And we're going to disguise it. And um, is that OK? And for people who are not used to this, it sounds wacky. It sounds wrong. 
And um, so this is again sort of saying, so when you come in and say this whole wacky enterprise is about tuberculosis, there's so much of the conversation that hasn't really happened. Um, I think I'll skip this. This is again the idea there, there just isn't a word for all these things. Um, when we do research in nutrition, it's very difficult to justify a placebo, given that nutritional deficiencies are very common in developing countries. However, there's a need to determine if a nutritional intervention will have a measurable health impact on the population or not. So this is a public health researcher, right? We know that vitamins are good for you. That's why they're supplemented all over the world. Um, foods are supplemented. And yet, even if you know that there are vitamin deficiencies around the world, sometimes what you need to be able to tell a health minister is what the impact will be of supplementing flour with vitamin A or supplementing some other common staple with zinc. And you have to be able to demonstrate what happens in terms of mortality, in terms of um, employability. And sometimes the way you do that is by giving half the people the supplemented flour and half the people not. You're not making anybody worse off. But this researcher clearly is troubled by the idea that she knows that people have deficiencies and what do you do. Um, OK. Uh, Will you or did you provide the intervention at the conclusion of the study? So again, we had a series of questions knowing how challenging it can be whether or not something should be provided afterwards. You do your study for five years, and then what happens? So here, this is one of the few places where I show the difference between our results from the US researchers and the international ones. So the question, unfortunately, in retrospect, um, should have been split into two parts. The question, however, wasn't, and it said, um, at the end of your study, because some people were in the middle of their study, some people had finished it. We said, at the end of your study, will the intervention be provided to people? Or at the end of the study that was completed, was it provided for people? And there's obviously a real difference between what potentially is wishful thinking and real honest to goodness it happened or it didn't. I've, never, I've done surveys for 20 years. I've never finished and gotten to the analysis where I haven't regretted some wording I wish I had done differently in a survey. So here we go. That's, here's, here's one for this survey. Um, to whom was it or will it be provided? Um, uh, the entire study population afterwards, 43% said that, um, all the way down to 26% to other regions of the, of the, of the country. Um, so uh, let's see. And oh, right. So, so while on the one hand, I think many of us um, gravitate very quickly toward an interest in trying to figure out how something that was studied in research and was shown to be successful could be made available to the country, I mean, for all the right reasons. It gets to be, again, complicated about who is supposed to think about that and what kind of an ethical good that is. Is it an ethical requirement? Is it an ethical good? Um, again, who's supposed to be thinking about it? Who's supposed to be paying for it? And if I'm the public health researcher at Johns Hopkins who's going and testing the malaria vaccine or this um, new drug for HIV, is it my responsibility to make sure that I negotiate with the government of that country or with um, the Global Fund or UNICEF or some other, or the Gates Foundation, to make sure that this intervention will be available afterwards. How good does my evidence need to be and how much of it is my job? And again, I think these are questions that we haven't addressed enough in ethics. Again, we sort of address why is it so important that studies then can make sure that interventions are provided afterwards. I don't think anybody disagrees with that. Of course, it's why the researcher is doing it. But I think we've spent far less time on the how that can happen and really who has a responsibility here um, when, when um, part of the whole problem is that we're working in a country where there's an inadequate health system to start with. Um, OK, let me keep going um, here. This just also, th this, we also asked a set of questions that have to do with um, capacity development in a larger uh, way of um, what, uh, separate from whether the drug or an intervention or vaccine is available afterwards, what is the study leaving behind? Um, and 98% uh, of our respondents said personnel who were trained. And that, I think, is um, an important finding. 90% um, said medical laboratory or office equipment. 80% said computer or data management um, systems. Um, again, the majority are leaving behind laboratory or office supplies. 68% um, said an organizational structure for healthcare or research. 50% said new buildings, laboratory facilities, or renovations that they did. And many large projects have um, hundreds of thousands of dollars for buildings. 
um, power equipment, water systems, or, or cars, et cetera. Um, all right, let me, um, let me do a few more of the, of the quotes about what happens when the study's over. The issue of what medical care to provide after the study, after the study is a thorny one. Research can lead to suggested improvements in medical care, but the funding of such improvements and building of the management skills required to implement them cannot be the focus of the research. A requirement of this sort would mean that for practical purposes, chronic illnesses cannot be researched since no research funding agency would agree to fund the treatment indefinitely. No funding mechanism that I know of will guarantee such action. In other words, the NIH funds your study and then the NIH will guarantee treatment for life. Therefore, this requirement would ban almost all research in developing countries. This is a case of the best being the mortal enemy of the good. I'm very concerned that this kind of feel-good regulation will constrain research that is useful to poor people in developing countries. I think the answer does not lie in prohibiting research on interventions that will not be available. In other words, there have, the, there have been proposals that you can't do research unless you know or there's some kind of guarantee it will be available afterwards. So this person says, I don't think the answer lies in prohibiting research on interventions that won't be available, but changing the way drugs and other interventions are marketed. The current flap about AZT in Africa, this tells you the timing of when this was, is a perfect case in point. The answer isn't that we shouldn't test AZT in Africa, but that drug companies should not be allowed to protect their huge profit margins. Changes in the IRB aren't going to change the power of big business interests. Um, OK, let me keep going. Um, I do think that all participants in the trial should have the benefit of whatever was found to be the best therapy. We had made provisions for them not to just get the experimental treatment, to, but to get the existing treatment they were going to be placed on indefinitely. So we had arrangements of the company for the treatment. We had arrangements for another company for another treatment. We had done everything we needed to do. Um, okay, our, interventions invo our intervention involves case finding, more extensive lab work than normally is provided, and the procurement of additional medication to treat the cases found. Medication is provided through the same government system it's normally provided through. However, it's my understanding that the involvement of researchers in normal public health activities has resulted in increased efficiency of medication procurement. These interventions are not the focus of the study, but the improvement in health care provision experienced by the local population is unlikely to outlive the study. I'm concerned that the community will feel abandoned when the study ends, and this will negatively impact their trust of the local public health system, which has been providing the enhanced services. So to me, there is embedded in this um, a really big challenge, right? So at the beginning of a study, we will often say, in the name of ethics, that a researcher has to make sure that certain things are in place. Right? They know people are going to come in with health needs. We want to make sure that if it's an HIV study that they're giving people HIV treatment, or if it's a malaria study, they're giving people malaria treatment, even if the local clinics aren't always well equipped. Right? That's generally an ethical requirement. And then we get to the study now is over for five years. It's, had, it's gone its, its course and it's over. And the research team maybe is going to stay for a long time, but maybe is going to pack up. And every, nobody questions whether there was benefit during those five years. There was. But now there's this sense of abandonment. It's like, oh, well, that doesn't feel right either. So maybe we should just study the, what goes on in sort of the natural environment. But no, 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 we told people they had to provide good treatment if they're going to go in. So we get to this um, challenge. OK, so this work that we had been um, doing uh, led me and many, many other people um, also to think that part of what, th there's many thoughts, there's many therefores from all of this data, but one kind of therefore is that people from the local environments need to be the ones debating and making decisions about these ethics questions. It's all fine and good for me to be part of the conversation, for me to find these interesting, for me to do my best to think about policy, but ultimately it is obviously, for the people of um, relevant countries to make their own policy. So the Fogarty International Center, which is a piece of the NIH that has invested for several decades in capacity development related to research generally, research skills, um, decided in the year 2000 to um, develop uh, funding mechanisms related to bioethics, and specifically to research ethics, because the NIH funds research. They, the Fogarty Center trains partners in low-income countries to be uh, partners on the research, again, for epi methods, vaccine methods, lab methods. And they decided in the year 2000 to make sure that there were people trained in other countries who would be the research partners who also had some background in ethics. So they created this funding mechanism 
where people like me could apply for a grant to um, propose some kind of capacity development in uh, research ethics. This came out of a set of um, highly publicized controversies in the late 1990s related to HIV transmission, where again, it was a highly contentious ethics issue. I won't go into the specifics. Um, but again, most of the people taking part in these debates about these hotly contested issues were um, North Americans. And there, it really was recognized there need to be people on the ground who can participate in the debates. So we've had our program at Johns Hopkins since the year 2000. I direct it with my wonderful colleague, Adnan Haider. We have a great advisory committee that's half from Hopkins and half from Africa. Um, and um, some of our objectives have changed over the 14 years. So these are our current um, objectives. The number one has been there from the beginning. Um, and two and three also. So our objectives are to train a critical mass of professionals in research ethics uh, from Africa with a focus on four core competencies, ethic prin ethics principles and theory, the teaching of ethics, because we knew people would go home with a train the trainer model, research on ethics for people interested in scholarship on it, and um, research ethics committee or IRB, leadership, capacity development, et cetera. To facilitate continuing education um, in ethics for trainees, to enable our trainees to develop strong links with colleagues across Africa. I do a lot of professional networking. I find it helpful. We figured that might be useful for them too. Um, to motivate trainees to make research ethics an important part, and much more recently to assist African institutions and not just individuals um, in, in some of these goals. So for our first nine years, we had what I've been telling um, some people I've been talking to here about the program already, what I call a graduate student model, meaning individuals who were interested would apply to us, we would train them, they would go home and do whatever were the next steps of their careers. Over that nine-year period, we had 28 trainees from 13 African countries. Um, it was a one-year program. They spent six months with us at Johns Hopkins, partly taking part in some of the graduate courses in bioethics we already had, partly taking part in a lot of activities that were designed specifically for them of IRB observation, a lot of seminars we put together, and very intensive mentoring. Um, I would generally meet with the trainee, with each of them individually once a week, figure out what their interests were, try to figure out how to maximize their time um, at Hopkins um, to, to further that. And then we gave them a seed grant, um, depending on the year and our budget and what was going on with Congress and NIH cuts literally, anywhere from five to $10,000 each to put um, in the field when they went back some kind of practicum. And we have heard from people that that is important for getting them doing bioethics um, at home. Um, and we had what I would call significant but variable productivity using that model. So here is the first uh, nine years, um, not quite all of our trainees, but some in the regions where people from where people came. Here's our fabulous alumni. Um, so here's what I'm going to call the good news, and, and I, it really is good news. Our trainees have been very productive. We tend to do a lot of mentoring long after they go home. Um, so a lot of um, incidents of people attending ethics workshops, teaching ethics courses, even getting grants, um, publications, et cetera. Um, more than 50% of our trainees, once they go home, are involved in all of those activities except for getting grants, which is 39%, which is still far better than I ever expected. Um, the challenges. Well, so the challenges are that the trainees were isolated. So we, um, I was uh, joking, I think, with Jonathan earlier, but it's not really a joke, that it's hard enough to think about getting a bioethics position in the United States where we now have bioethics centers all over the country. Imagine being from Africa and going back where, at the time we started our program, there were really no bioethics centers. There's a, there were a couple good programs in South Africa, um, certainly no bioethics programs elsewhere in Africa. And so these trainees who maybe had been a malaria lab virologist, who always were interested in the human sides of their research, came to us, had this one year of training, came back, and their institution happily released them for the training, but then they went back and they're expected to continue to be a malaria lab virologist, and it was really hard for them to figure out how to keep doing their ethics work. A lot of people did it sort of at night and on the weekends, and again, were remarkably productive. Some people had a little bit more ethics-y kinds of jobs, like they were the staff person for their IRB, um, but there was variable opportunity and variable um, institutional uh, support. Therefore, not only was it frustrating for them as individuals, but it was variable impact on programmatic change. So we called, we, we hosted a meeting in Kenya in 2009. We invited the 
10 people, at least I, we knew of, um, who were African, who were doing the most um, work, best work in bioethics, and asked them what they thought we should do. And it led to a shift in model to what we then called an institutional partnership. African institutions, and we pretty quickly made it a requirement that they were African universities for the kinds of reasons I described earlier, as opposed to other nonprofits, could apply to us as an institution to say, we want, for example, the University of Botswana to be your institutional partner next year. And we said to them that if they were an institutional partner, we would train some of their individual faculty or staff. We would go to the country and do some kinds of, of work and some more strategic thinking. The goal was to really start to develop a bioethics program at some number of African um, institutions. It was a requirement, and they had to demonstrate this in their application, that they had commitment at the highest level of leadership of their university, already have some individuals who were trained, and again, had some kind of vision of developing a program. So our first um, selected institution was um, University of Botswana, then Makere University in Uganda, and then the University of Zambia School of Medicine. So this model uh, also worked well glass half full, glass half empty slash challenge, is that one year was like the tip of the iceberg. It was the beginning and not at all the end. And so um, what we then moved to last year was what we're now calling a consortium model. And that is at least our plan for the, we get funded in four or five year um, uh, uh, blocks. And so we're now in, I think, year two of a five-year funding cycle. And our plan for these five years is this consortium model, um, which means um, that we now have a commitment to work with these same three institutions, period. And if we get a lot more funding one day, maybe we'll add a fourth or a fifth. But our commitment is to University of Botswana, Makere University, and the University of of Zambia. It allows us to have much more and sustained engagement, much deeper human relationships, professional relationships with these colleagues, um, much more cross-fertilization among these institutions. One of the things that we've now put in our budget is for some of these folks to travel to each other's institutions um, for teaching, for learning how they do things. Um, some of our members have been part of other kinds of consortia in Africa, which is, which is helpful. We still have a piece of this program of the training budget goes to um, one long-term training from each institution and one short-term training just for um, the month of June where we have a lot of extra intensive activities come to us. We have an annual consortium meeting in Africa. Again, we go to each site um, at least once a year and significantly we work on strategic planning. So we spend a fair amount of time doing the kind of strategic planning that you do if you wanted to create a new department at a university. Who do you need to talk to? Who needs to be in the loop? Who are the stakeholders? Um, should we be talking to the deans? Who's the person who's against this? What's their issue? How are you going to get the budget? What's the, what grants are you eligible for? There's a lot of that kind of strategy, along with, obviously, a lot of discussion about ethics. So I'm going to skip these. It's just showing that we continue to have some productivity. Here's our crew, um, again, based on some different meetings and a lot of our spectacular people from all around the world. Um, so what's gone well? The institutions and individuals are very eager and engaged. The, the attitudinal motivation stuff is really, really great. Um, and there's a lot of teaching and training and papers. Uh, the challenges are, I would say, I have a few things on the slide. I would say um, the, the two things that are really the most challenging for me are the top two. There are so few resources for everything people want to do. And people write these strategic plans that we all work together to, to make realistic, and even so, they would, of course, have a much stronger bioethics program if they could hire more people, if they could train more people, if they could send more people for PhDs, and um, if they could, if the universities themselves had better resources. There are, um, we, we were in uh, Zambia, I was in Zambia last month, and it was the first time we were there where the um, School of Medicine had Wi-Fi and any kind of decent internet connection. And the, that kind of thing, what it means for being able to access international do guidance documents, journal articles, if you want to get your students to be reading things, they have to be able to access them. So those kinds of things are really huge. And the other thing, which I know people in this room know, but it's, um, it's something that I think about a lot with this training program, is that it takes a long time, I think, to learn bioethics well. The people I know who try to become faculty in bioethics in the United States have spent 
years thinking about bioethics, studying bioethics, reading bioethics, writing bioethics. And we developed these train the trainer models, which is all fine and good maybe for doing a short workshop. But so we now have people we've trained for a year or two. There's a small number of people at each of these places who actually do have PhD or master's level training in bioethics. But to really have a robust department where you can not only train everybody else, but you can really confront all of these tough issues. Like, what are you going to say to your researcher colleagues when they want to know what their ancillary care responsibilities are? What are you going to say when they need to figure out whether a placebo is OK? You sort of need, I think, in my personal view, I, maybe I'm just basing this on my own experience, I, I really feel like spending a lot of years thinking about these issues makes a difference. And I see that in our students, and I see that in my colleagues. and. Um, you do what you can do. Um, but I find it very challenging that um, it takes a long time to learn bioethics well. So I guess maybe the other way to frame that is it's just it's a slow process. I think it's, I think it's working in a certain kind of way, but I think it's a slow process. Um, so going forward, the attention to all this I think is good. Um, having more partners engaged I really think is good. Um, we sometimes have a lot of these discussions in the academy and we need more partners in it. There are a lot more efforts going on, so I don't want to leave this by making it sound like Fogarty is the only um, player here. Um, the, the EDCTP grants come out of Europe. Wellcome Trust comes out of Great Britain. Um, they're providing a lot of grants to people in um, low and middle income countries related to ethics training or research. The MEPI grant is a particular mechanism that the NIH has put in place to strengthen medical schools in low income countries, but they have a dedicated component to research and to ethics. Um, and I guess my last thought uh, going forward is that both research and ethics must be part of the fabric and narrative. My last little anecdote, um, also from when we were in Zambia last month, is that we were having a lot of conversations with the faculty and with the students about research ethics. And the dean was saying to me that he really wants to make sure that one outcome of our program is that the students are trained better in research ethics because the faculty are supervising student projects. And the, the, um, both the faculty and the students need to be better trained so they can do that. And that's all great. And then at some point, I asked one of our closer colleague collaborators, so how many of the faculty are themselves doing research? And you know, he sort of squirmed a little bit, but it, the answer basically was almost nobody. So all of a sudden, there was this context for teaching research ethics that almost, I think, becomes a very academic kind of training exercise. And it turned out that most of the faculty think research is important, don't do research, and the people who do research end up going to these external research collaborations. They leave the university and go work for some of the other projects. So there's this bigger question here about, again, how to make research and ethics part of all the narrative. So I think, I think that's everything. Good. OK, thanks. I want to just uh, hear you perhaps elaborate a little further on the relationship between the sort of empirical work and the, and the difficult ethical questions. So as you know, there's this vast literature under your heading of sort of justice. You know, what do we owe communities in which in low and middle income countries where we do this research? Is it reasonable availability? Well, that doesn't work in all occasions because sometimes it's not successful. So you don't have a drug to make reasonably available. And then there's a broader fair benefits approach. Alex John London argues, no, it's um, research only as right. development, right. only as human development. And then, of course, there are other ways of thinking about it, which is to look at the the norms within that community and make sure that the research you're doing um, reciprocates in a manner that's consistent with those norms. So how, but how does your empirical work where you ask people what they give and what ought to be given, and of course you're asking researchers, how does that um, empirical work inform and help us address the, the rather vexing ethical question? Yeah, it's such a great question, Jonathan. So, so, um, I guess I'll preface by saying, as someone who does empirical work and, and policy thinking and some ethics writing, it's a question I think about all the time. And I train our doctoral students to do both empirical working at work and more normative uh, thinking and writing. And it's, it is really important for us to think about what work can empirical data do and what work can it or they not do. So I think that for this kind of data, which is purely descriptive, 
about researchers' experiences, I actually think that it um, does two things. I think partly it just provokes conversation. And I know that sounds silly, but I really mean it authentically. Um, you hear what researchers are doing, you hear about their experiences, and you say, okay, well, how about this? How about that? There's nothing in it that's normative. It just, it just makes it all more concrete. You hear what they've decided to do, and it gets the conversation going in a much more real way. I also think that their experiences give some context to what seems possible and what doesn't seem possible, at least from their perspective. And they add voices to a debate or argument before you even get started among ourselves, so to speak. So we might have a debate about whether something needs to be provided afterwards, even if it were effective. They're already contributing some of their concerns about that requirement. And I can then decide to reject that, but they've already put in some what you almost might call normative kinds of arguments in providing their data, so I think that's helpful. There are other kinds of data that also could be relevant that we um, collect in countries from people um, about what their experiences, you know, I think more work could be done of going to communities where re research projects have been there for a really long time or for research projects have come and gone and trying to understand what that experience was like for people and whether there's any kind of consensus that it was in general good or in general bad. We have a lot of reasons why we can think up it could be really good for a project to be there for a long time or for it to come and go or really bad. And smart people can come up with all of the logic of why it could be good or why it could be bad, but that's a place where I think at least hearing from people what their experiences were would be helpful. Most of the obstacles you've identified in the development work that you've done have um, had a major source of origin in the countries where the development work is being done. And a source of concern for me is issues of circumstances whereby problems in the U.S. domestic IRB system could be infecting or becoming a source for problems in research abroad. Uh, and the example that I was thinking of, and it's really just meant as an example, is uh, in your empirical work and in your knowledge of other empirical work on this research abroad, the role that for-profit IRBs have played in that scope of research. So that's not where I thought you were going. That's very interesting. So, um, so let me go back to the more general point, and then we can go to the more specific. So um, it is a big, big, big risk that we not only export our ethics thinking, but that we export procedures <laughs> that are not working that well. I, I, I want to be I don't mean to, I don't mean to suggest that there's nothing in the IRB system that's working well. There's a lot of things that are working well, but there are some pieces that um, if you're going to start all over, you might redo a little bit. Um, and uh, so uh, there is this funny situation where the U.S. rules require for understandable reasons that if you're going to be spending U.S. dollars, you have to follow U.S. rules. That goes for all sorts of things. People in other countries have to sign this drug-free workplace statement the way we do when we get a grant in the United States. Um, but it ought to be an opportunity to think about um, whether the things that we are requiring are good. And secondly, since these are ethics requirements, if perhaps it would be respectful to see if there are other approaches that would also be good. And there was a big push, particularly at the time of NBAC's work, for something called equivalent protections, um, where there would be some mechanism by which to evaluate whether the, uh, the way that ethics oversight was conducted in, for example, Uganda, Botswana, or Zambia struck the American institution or the funder as sufficiently equivalent in terms of providing honest to goodness ethical protection that we could say, okay, it's a different system, but it's good, it's working. We need to make sure that XYZ is taken care of and they're doing it. Um, but uh, that was rejected. So I mean, in terms of for-profit, I guess, um, I guess you're, am, I, am I understanding your question right that sort of we have a for-profit industry here and now the for-profit industry is going global? So, so there's two pieces to that question. One is, what does it mean to have a central IRB in charge when there are many, many sites? And then the other is, is there, a, is there, are there any extra concerns or not if that coordinating group is is a for-profit IRB versus, for example, a university one? Um, this is another 
I guess for me, the idea of central IRBs are a trade-off. And there's a lot of discussion right now in US research ethics policy about central IRBs. So for people who are not in the weeds on this, um, what this means is that if there were a study that were um, occurring at, let's say, eight institutions even in the United States, um, the default, the norm, is that it would need to go through the IRB at each of those eight institutions. If you have a central IRB, there becomes instead one IRB of record. And, that, uh, and the eight institutions essentially delegate their reviewing responsibility to that one. Now, the good news about the, the advantage of having a central IRB is that when you send your project through eight IRBs, it takes a really long time. And lo and behold, you tend to get eight completely different sets of comments. It's not simply that you have to respond eight times. You have to respond eight times to eight really different things. And it's just the way it works in human committees. So investigators have a lot of frustration, understandably, of going to lots and lots of IRBs. And what if it was 25 instead of eight? Um, because they get their funding, and it may be literally two years before they're ready to go into the field simply because of the IRB process. The central IRB eliminates that. And actually, Jerry Menikoff, who's head of OHRP, this, again, the federal uh, regulating agency, has encouraged more institutions to do that. The crazy thing is that institutions are very anxious about giving up that responsibility. And so it's sort of between a rock and a hard place. It makes the investigators crazy that they have to go to so many IRBs. I, I really think this is something that the investigators and their own institutions have to work out. Because the feds have basically given us the option to do it either way. There's then this whole other question about there, there's a big literature now on for-profit IRBs and whether they have any more conflict of interest than a university IRB. There's a lot of reason to th think um, sort of uh, reflexively that they have a lot of conflict of interest because somebody comes and pays them. Um, they promise to give a review pretty quickly. And you could think, boy, that's a great market. You know, I'll pay you more if you give me my approval. I'll pay you more if you give me my approval fast. Um, and there has always been this concern that they know that they get um, their customers when their customers are happy. And won't they make them all happy if they give them a lot of approvals? Um, I guess I am. Um, less concerned about that than some people are, maybe because I know a little bit about two of them, um, where I think the quality is high and there's a lot of checks and balances and, and quality controls. But that's just my personal opinion. I do think it's important to remember that universities also have tons of conflicts of interest on their IRBs. It's, um, there's the conflict of personal relationships, which can be really helpful. But you know, Jonathan submits a protocol to my IRB. I know Jonathan. I think he's got a lot of integrity. I think he's thoughtful. He cares about human rights. I am predisposed to love this protocol before I even turn to page one. Not to mention, Jonathan's grant is $12 million. And every federal grant comes with something called indirects or overheads. And I know that NIH funding has gone down this year. I mean, th anyway, there's a lot of conflicts that can happen in our academic environment, too. And so this is another situation where I think you, know, you have to be aware of conflicts, and you have to think about all the ways you safeguard against them and all the checks and balances you put in place. So. So I've been looking, wor working recently and looking at various aspects of, um, of risk in informed consent and how you communicate it. And working specifically with the head of cardiology at a local um, uh, health collaborative. And basically, he's convinced that you can't adequately communicate risk to patients. And this is within the Pennsylvania context. So I found myself then thinking about some of the additional barriers that might come with communicating risk in other cultural contexts. So I'm wondering if you've given this some thought and if you could reflect upon what those additional barriers might be to communicating risk and then what you do to overcome them. Yeah. Thank you for the question. So um, I guess my first thought is that it's very important to not let consent do the work of minimizing risk. So by that I mean 
a research study has to have a reasonable benefit to risk ratio for it to be ethically acceptable. And no amount of consent or permission can change that. So our most important safeguard against risk is the way we design the study. What's in place, what's being provided, who's eligible, what kinds of sort of safety nets are built into the structure of the trial, who staffs it, all sorts of things like that are to me the most essential pieces of dealing with risk and minimizing risk in any kind of research study in any setting. Nonetheless, there are going to be studies that go forward that are higher risk. And um, there was a little line on one of the slides that I don't think I said, which is um, one of the fundamental challenges in informed consent is just how much people have to understand. We know from literature that people are never fully informed. Um, on one end of the spectrum where they have absolutely no clue what's going on, it's easy, um, and people are never fully informed on the other end. So where in the middle do we decide there's an adequate understanding? And what constitutes adequate understanding? My view is that for particular studies, it would be great if researchers asked themselves, what is adequate understanding for my study? And I think the answer to that is going to be completely different for different studies, sometimes because they're higher and lower risk, and then obviously because the particulars of studies vary. I happen to be in favor of a extra little piece of a consent process where a researcher says to a participant, um, can you tell me in your own words what this study is about? I know I've given you a lot of information. Can you tell me in your own words what this study is about? Um, and then maybe there's a couple follow-up questions like, um, I've told you that good things and bad things could happen in the study. Can you tell me, you know, what any of those are? And then maybe a question about, it, tell me what would happen if you decide to say no. Um, I think that's a real opportunity to, to get some conversation going. And that might be where I may have on my list, there are four things this person really needs to know. They need to know that this treatment is experimental. They need to know that half of them get a placebo. They, may need, they need to know that if they don't do this, it's really risky and they have to come back. Or they need to know that um, uh, <laughs> I teach a research ethics class now, and I had a, a guy come to um, guest lecture, I guess, be, visit in my class two weeks ago who's a healthy volunteer, who's been in a lot of studies as a healthy volunteer. And he volunteered to be in a malaria challenge study where as a healthy person, he tried some medicine. Turns out it didn't work. And put his arm in a thing of, of a, a, a cage of a lot of malaria-ridden mosquitoes. And he got malaria. So it would be really important for him to understand people like that to understand what risk is. So that would be one of the questions that I would make sure I ask someone. So I guess it's a, it's a um, backwards way of getting at how do you communicate risk. I don't know. I mean, people have different strategies. There's people who make it comparable to other kinds of things. There's people who describe it. Um, you know, if you get malaria, this is how you're going to be sick, and this is what we're going to do to help you. Um, but I actually think, at very least, we have to figure out what we want to make sure they know, and we can figure out ways about whether or not people know it. How do ethicists write uh, international guidelines so as not to disincentivize international research? Um, because my understanding is that poorer nations, a lot of times their academic institutions are sort of academic islands, and we want to you know, make sure that that doesn't happen. So how do you write it so that first that doesn't happen, and also, how do you try to incentivize those relationships so that they're healthy and they last a long time without compromising the ethics of, of a study? So let me make sure I'm understanding the question, because maybe there's, maybe there's two important questions in there. Um, I think the way most people approach guideline creation or revision is to get a lot of people in the room from different backgrounds. Now, even so, it's like, who knows? Sometimes it's the same people called over and over again. But I think um, all the documents that I showed up there that call themselves international guidelines, CEOMS and the UNAIDS one, and et cetera, have a pretty um, international group of drafters. Now, again, you could argue that it would be a lot better if they had more um, community engagement around the guideline development and things like that. But so the, the first part of your question that I think has to do with how do you make sure that the guideline is both protective but also recognizes that in the long run research may be a really good enterprise for these poor countries. Um, 
And so it's sort of both um, appropriately balancing the good of research with the cautions of research. Uh, it seems to me that, um, it, it seems silly to say it, but um, you, that has to be part of the conversation, right? That's part of writing a good ethics guideline. Um, and uh, I'm imagining that people who put together those groups are somewhat mindful of that. Almost all of these approaches, all of these um, guidelines have a strategy where they do, ha they don't necessarily have to do community engagement up front, but they have to um, put drafts out very publicly for public comment. Um, and that's a time when a lot of things um, come back. The second part of your question, I think, had to do with how do you develop a good research collaboration? And um, <laughs> that's a great and really hard question. I, uh, it's hard to, I mean, there's a similar kind of question even in the United States. And um, it's a little like, how do you find a good partner? Um, I don't, I, I'm not trying to sound silly, I don't quite know. I mean, so, I think that a lot of research, international research collaborations start through serendipity. I know at Johns Hopkins where I work, where there's a ton of global health research, there's a fair number that started when an MPH student from some country came to Johns Hopkins, they and their advisor get into all sorts of conversations, the student actually has a position of real responsibility at home, like they're the minister of health, or they work at some, the key university, and they say, I'd like to start a research program on nutrition, and their professor says, I'll help you, and then next thing you know, they write a grant together, and then next thing you know, 20 years later, there they are with this amazing research collaboration that now involves 50 other people. So I think there is sometimes that kind of serendipity, and I actually think that helps because I think when you start with a relationship, it's more respectful, people listen to each other, and there's more potential that it's gonna last. I do have a bias about um, what I think is the good that happens when you have a long-term research collaboration, I just think you, uh, I think there's a lot of problems that happen when you go and you leave that don't happen when you're there for a long time, even though other problems happen. I don't think that that is always possible. I would never say you can't do the other kind. And again, who knows what's going to happen with our Fogarty projects. Um, but I do think that uh, somehow if you're creating a relationship where there is a potential for a lot more things to happen, it can be good. Please join me in thanking Dr. Katz for her time. Thank you.